Christ's spirit that he will save them and he will not pass you by this morning. He's no respecter of persons. He don't care your color, your race, your wealth, your age. If you'll call out upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved today. Praise the Lord. That's some good news to know that we have a God that ain't going to respect another above me just because they have something that I don't. I forgot my water over there. You can bring it to me, honey. Thank you. My throat's a little dry and I'll never make it without a drink of water. If everybody don't care, let's bow our head. Lord, Heavenly Father, God, I know who I am and what I am without you, and it's, it's none. But I thank you for moving in on me that day that you saved me. I thank you for coming into my heart. I thank you for the calling on my life. God, I know I can't preach, but I know that your spirit within me is, is powerful, and it can preach to me. And I pray that you, you fill me with your spirit, and that you speak through me, God, for your people, for your church, God. Help me be the mouth of peace you called me to be. And I pray to you glorify your name. In Jesus' name I ask this thing in your praise. Amen. 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 <clears throat> you can turn in your Bible if you want to the Gospel of Luke. I think it's chapter 22. I've never preached on this. Um, one of my dad's favorite passages. And uh, I've heard him say this for years, which uh, is before I was going to church, but I heard him say this for years. Uh, he, he suffered a lot uh, before he died. And uh, I don't know, he, he would always quote this scripture. This is at the Last Supper. Peter's doing all this. I never leave thee, I never forsake thee. I go to prison with thee, I, I, I die for thee, and look what Jesus tells Peter. Peter's also uh, Simon. The Lord said unto him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. I want you to notice what Jesus says to Peter. He said, Peter, Simon Peter, Satan has desired to have you. What does the word desire mean? I'm having a desire at this point in my life to try to have a vacation this summer with my family, with my brothers and my mother. Uh, my dad passed away 15 years ago, uh, and it was a few years before that. Uh, since we all been on vacation together, it's, it's going on 20 years. I have a strong desire to do that. And when it happens, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be very joyful when it finally happens. Desires, whenever you get what you desire, that's what makes you happy. Notice what Satan's desire is. Satan's desire is to have Peter. The only joy, the only pleasure that the devil gets in this world is whenever he causes sorrow and suffering and pain in your life. The only joy that Satan gets with you is whenever he can drag you into hell or bring sin in your life. A lot of people don't realize what kind of enemy you have. Satan was an archangel that stood before the Almighty God. He was probably the most beautiful of all angels. That's what caused him to sin. It said he was corrupted by his own beauty and by his own brightness and his own wisdom was he corrupted. And he started looking at self instead of looking at God and he became very selfish. And now he's all together made in sin. And now the only joy and the only desire he has is coming against you. He hates you with a perfect hatred today. A lot of times we don't realize, you know, especially like little kids, the devil make you do it. You know, the devil don't make you do it. He tries, he wants you to do it. He tries to make you do it. But all he can do is put the thought in your mind or in, in the, make you desire through love. But he can't actually make you do anything. But I want you to know that he has a desire. He has a joy. He has a pleasure. It causes you pain. It causes you suffering. It causes you harm, and he has no greater pleasure than whenever he finally gets to take one out of this world in sin. 
And then we go to a devil's hell. I love God. And I want to serve God. I, love, I, I try to love God more and more. And I want my whole heart to be full of God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I want Jesus to be on my mind and on my heart. And I want to serve God. But by the same token, the more I grow in the Lord, the more I find that I have an enemy that's against me. The more I grow in the Lord, the more I feel Satan coming against me. The more I grow in the Lord, the more I realize I have an enemy whose only joy and desire is to bring suffering and pain to my life. And all he wants to do is shut me up and not be a lot to anybody or bring anybody to Jesus Christ. And now I'm starting to get a perfect... Just like I want a perfect love for God, I'm starting to get a perfect hatred for the devil. I'll show you something in the book of Job. This is something that most of you may not know unless you study this out. This, this message may surprise you. Last week I preached on the throne of God. At the throne of God. There's well over a billion angels. It, it numbers a billion and then says and thousands of thousands, which is pretty much an innumerable number. Around the throne of God, and the way God had it set up on earth, uh, uh, it was after the pattern in heaven and on earth, the way he had the people to encamp, the people encamped in the shape of a cross. And I believe in heaven, God sets up on his throne the one who has to hide his face from the universe because it'll roll up like a scroll and run from his face to Zion. I believe all them angels, them billions of angels, is around his throne in the form of a cross. Because everything hinges on the cross. And there are certain times when these angels come before God for certain reasons that I don't understand and the Bible don't go into details. But look what it says in Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God, these are the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, before God's throne. And notice what happened. Satan shows up. A lot of times we, we don't realize this. Do you know Satan's allowed to go to heaven before God's throne right now? He's allowed to show up up there and talk to God against you. Do you know that? Look here. Satan came among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and upright. Man, that word perfect means complete, lacking nothing. It means he, he got a prayer life, he got a given life, he, he's lacking nothing. No meaning he's without sin. One that feareth God and the shoe evil. And Satan answered the Lord and says, Doth Job fear God for naught, for nothing? You got a hedge about him and about his house and all that he had on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth now thy hand and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. What does Satan want? Satan's desire to get Job to curse God. And if Job was to curse God, they wouldn't have made nothing. Uh, Satan, <laughs> they wouldn't have made nothing made Satan happier concerning the whole story of Job. They Seeing Job curse God. Let me show you something really cool about this. When I was a young Christian and I first started going to church, uh, about every church service I'd hear somebody testify, well, I'm like old Job, well, I'm like old Job. Let's look at old Job. Let me tell you what happened. He had, he's one of the richest men in the East. He had thousands of cattle, thousands of donkeys, thousands of bulls, and every bit of it was destroyed. The devil took it off from him. He had all kinds of servants, hundreds of servants, servants and they all died. He had seven sons and three daughters who was a feast, and he caused a wind to come up against the house, and the wall fell in and collapsed and killed all ten of his children. And here's somebody running to tell Joe with the news. You've lost everything. All your cattle, all your sheep, all your donkeys, all your servants are dead, and your seven sons and three daughters, they're also dead. What does Joe do? Then Joe arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down on the ground and what? He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Place it. That was a big shoe to fill. Is it not? Yeah, 
you may be like Job in the sense of, yeah, Satan is going uh, to God's throne, or one of his angels is going to God's throne, requesting that they can cause suffering in your life. I know we got some people in here that's had a lot of suffering in their life, and a lot of times they wonder why. Well, I'm going to tell you two reasons why. One reason is, it's because you're just going through a trial, and God's going to bring you out of it greater than what you was before you went in. Job lost everything he had, but when it was all said and done, God gave him back double, and then gave him a 140-year life. So praise the Lord, he ended up getting all back double plus a normal life. But look here, the devil wasn't done. Again, the angels come to present themselves before God, and Satan shows up again. And the Lord said unto Satan, I mean, here God, he, Satan is going to take everything from him. He, he went from a rich man to he's poor. He went from having servants to having none. He went from having ten children to having none, and now he has none. And Satan goes before God again. And Satan, and God says, You consider my servant Job, there's none like him, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God as he was evil. And look here. He took me everything from me. He still holds facts as integrity. You say he would curse me. He hasn't cursed me. He's blessed me. He's worshipped me. Even though you move with me against him to destroy him without cause. Satan answered the Lord said, skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath, he will give for his life. And if you know the rest of the story of Job, then God allowed Satan to touch him but not destroy his life. And he put a disease on him. He had boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. And then his own wife come and said, Curse God and die, Job. He said, You speak like a foolish boy. But the thing I'm wanting to do then is that the devil and these angels are allowed to go before God. And they're allowed to accuse you. Why are they allowed to accuse you? Why does God allow this to happen? Why does God allow these evil spirits? these lying spirits, and even the devil himself to go before his throne and accuse me. Why does God allow that? Does not God hate the devil? Is not God aggravated at the devil and all that Satan has destroyed? God had made the earth in seven days and seven nights. Six days resting on the seventh day. And said, Behold, it is very good. Satan come and destroy. The heavens must be destroyed. The earth must be destroyed. Every tree, every plant, every animal, every man, every woman, every born, everything that ever had life must be destroyed. All because Satan brought sin in the garden. Satan, through sin, destroyed all the perfect work of the Lord. <coughs> Why does God then allow it? The Ten Commandments that we love so much? Thou shalt, thou shalt not. God gave 613 commandments, 10 of them was written in stone. The other 603 and the 10 was written on paper. And then were commandments of living holy and righteous before God. Thou shalt is the living righteous, that's the knowledge of good. <coughs> Thou shalt not is what you shouldn't do, is the knowledge of evil. And we all break them commandments. Every single one of us break the commandments of God. And when you break the commandment of God, then you've done evil, you've done sin, you've done the same thing that Satan has. Therefore, he has every right to stand before God and to condemn you because you've broken God's holy law. What we don't realize is we holler God's good, the devil's evil, but we, we just throw ourselves all of a sudden over in the good pile like we've done something great. No, you're not in the good pile. You're in the bad pile. The Bible says all sin that comes short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that understands God. There's no fear of God before our eyes. Isaiah said, We're always an unclean thing, and our best is with rags. That's why Satan has a right to accuse you. That's why you need Jesus Christ so bad. That's why you need him so bad. The Bible says, When you stand before God, the holy commandments. You know, if you break one commandment, that's sin. Sin's not allowed in heaven. Jesus said, or Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not lie. Bear false witness. <coughs> Who in here hasn't done that? The Bible said, The Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not take God's name in vain. Who in here has not done that? We've all done that. Satan has every right to go and accuse God because we've committed the same crime he's committed. We don't want to put ourselves in the same boat with the devil. But we've committed the same 
Satan says that he's committed. Of course, he was a lot higher being than we are. But still, yet Satan has that right. And because of the commandments, you know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3? All the world. So we can all get off our high horse. Maybe you never was a prostitute. Maybe you never did do drugs. Maybe you never did get drunk. You can still get off your high horse because the Bible says all the world is guilty. Every man, every woman, everybody is guilty. And the Bible says that you won't even be able to open your mouth to defend yourself in that day. But if you'll come to Jesus Christ, He kept all them commandments for you. And then He took all your sin upon Himself and died for it. And when you stand before God and you ain't allowed to open your mouth because Satan has done accused you of all your sin, it's then that the Bible says that the blood of Christ will speak for you. Praise the Lord. That's why we need the cross. That's why we need the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because we have an enemy that's only desire is to cause us suffering and pain. And the only joy that Satan will ever have in your life is if he can actually get you to go to hell. And to be honest, we deserve it. We don't need justice. A lot of times we holler justice. We don't need justice. If we get the just punishment for sin, it's hell. We need mercy. We need grace. And that's Jesus Christ on the cross. Praise the Lord. He took all your sin. Everybody, think of the worst thing you've ever done. He took it. He put it on himself. And he stood before God as he was you. When God saw me only at the cross, he saw you. Yes, God, he gets, just like you punish your child when they do something wrong, God has to punish sin. But when God looked at the cross, He saw you. He saw your sin and He took His belt off and He beat Christ. Not you. Because He saw you. But when you got saved, the Bible says the church become the body of Christ. Now when God looks at you, He sees Him. Just like it pleased God to bruise Jesus because He saw you at the cross, now it pleases God to bless you because He sees Christ in your heart. That's something to get excited about. You mean, preacher, when God looks in my heart, He sees Jesus Christ? Yes. That ought to make you smile. You want to know why? Because God can't look at His Son and not be happy. God can't look at His Son and not be joyful. God can't look at His Son and not want to bless Him. And when God looks at your heart, He's not to see. And not only does He see Jesus, the Bible says He sees the face of Christ. Praise That's something to get excited about. Don't try to stand before God with, well, I'm a good person. I didn't lie. I didn't cheat. I didn't steal. You're all together an unclean thing without God. Trust in when God looks at me, He sees Jesus. <coughs> Jesus is in my heart. And if Jesus Christ is in your heart, I beg you today. If He touches your heart, to make that decision. Because if God don't look at you and see Christ in your heart, He will see sin. And all the accusations that you're hearing in the devil raise against you will be carried forward. If you can be a good person and go to heaven, why would Jesus leave heaven? Jesus made the world, John 1, 12, and the world knew him not. Why would he die on the cross if you could get there by being good? It would be pointless for him to come to the cross. It would be pointless for him to be a poor man for 33 years. It would be pointless for him to wear the crown of thorns and let us nail him up there if you can do something to be good on your own. Let me show you another scripture. This is in uh, Kings and in Chronicles. I get first and second stuff mixed up all the time. Second Chronicles 18 if you want to turn to your own Bible. But a lot of people don't know that evil spirits and the devil is allowed to go to God's throne and accuse you any time they want. Look at this. What, what's going on here is the king of Judah and the king of Israel are coming together and they're wanting to go up and battle against the Syrians. And uh, Ahab has rejected God for 20 some years. And he's one of the most evil, wickedest king Israel had ever known. And whenever they went ready to go up, the king of Judah said, Well, don't you think we should uh, get a prophet to prophesy and see, see, see if uh, 
if they think we should go. <coughs> so he brought out all these evil prophets and said, should we go up? And they all, oh yeah, go up. God's going to give you all the land. God's going to give you the kings and everything's going to be yours. Everything's going to be great. But the king of Judah feared God a little bit. He said, are they not a prophet of the Lord? That we may inquire what the Lord says? Because all his prophets were not the Lord. They were the prophets of Baal and one. They, they were wishy-washy. They believed in God, but they believed in all these other gods as well. And they were just wishy-washy. So they brought out Micaiah. And again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. This is what Micaiah said. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. And all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left as the billions of angels. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake saying after this man, and another saying after that man, and listen to this. And there came out a spirit. And stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt prevail. Go, even do so. I want you to know something. When you live a life rebellious to God, God will allow these evil angels to come in your life. He will allow them to come in and possess you. Take over your job, take over your marriage, take over your home. You want to know, uh, if, if, you, if you're not a Christian here today, you want to know why? Man, I just can't get no relief. That might be why. You've rejected God for so long that He's, all right, you don't want me, then you can have Him. I want you to know something. God loves you with a perfect love. Jesus loves you with a love that He left heaven's glory to die for you, but He didn't leave heaven's glory to die for you to twist your arm to make you serve Him. He's a king, not a beggar. He's not going to beg you. He's a king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Yeah. The angels fall down and worship him. Yeah. Freely. He's not going to twist your arm. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil against thee. Then Zedekiah, the son of Cananiah, came near and smote. Micaiah upon the cheek and said, Which way would the Spirit of the Lord from many of the leaders speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, You'll see. You're going to go hide yourself in the inner chamber one day. You're going to see. I don't know the end of that guy, but I hear it But the thing that I'm trying to get across to you is that these evil spirits, because Ahab, Elijah came to Ahab repeatedly and told him, you need to serve God. And Elijah called down fire in front of him. He challenged the God of Baal, which is the one Israel went after. He challenged before the whole nation of Israel and called fire down from heaven in front of the king, in front of all Israel, and they still went after the other gods. He was one of the most wicked kings ever was. His wife Jezebel was the most wicked woman I've ever read about in the Bible or history. Hated God with a perfect hatred. Therefore, God allowed this lying spirit just to do it. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. And Ahab says, I want you to take Micaiah. I want you to throw him in prison. I want you to feed him bread of affliction and water of affliction until I return. And Micaiah says, if you return, then the Lord didn't speak about me because you want to die. And he said, all ears are real here. And Ahab went up to die. So, show you one more real fast. I think it's 2 Samuel, no, it's 1 Samuel 16. Before I get to the main point of what I'm trying to shoot for here. 1 Samuel 16, 14. King Saul has rejected the calling of God in his life. And he's going about trying to establish his own kingdom and he's going against David, God's anointed. And it says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And look what it says. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. See, these evil spirits would come before God. Satan would come before God. What for? To accuse you. And rightly so, we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. But those who trust in the sacrifice, those who trust in the blood of the Lamb, God will keep the evil spirits away from him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubles him. Notice it says the evil spirits from God. God okayed it. He wants to run after the ways of the devil, then okay. Then the devil can go after him.
See, evil spirits is what possesses people. And I'll show you that real fast in the book of Acts. I think it's chapter 19. Verse 13 through 16. There was these, everybody had went after Christianity. I mean, all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came down upon Peter and the rest of the apostles, and they was raising the dead. They was opening the eyes of the blind. They was bringing their sick folk out. That maybe just a shadow of Peter would come up on them and heal their sick, and it would. And they were casting out devils, and they hear these Jews that didn't receive Christ. They thought, well, you know, we're going to do this too because we want people to stay following us. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, Took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. They had these people that had these evil spirits. See, these evil spirits come from the Lord and possess people. And they came in the name of the Lord saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Look what the evil spirits say. And there was the seven sons of Sheba, a Jew, and the chief priest which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And they, there's a good message in this. Does, does the devil know your name? If you're on part with Jesus Christ, he knows your name. He knew Paul's name. He didn't know their name. You're on par for God, he knows your name because he's up there trying to accuse you before God. He's up there trying to accuse you before God. I'm going to show you one more passage of Scripture and uh, this is some good news. And then I'm going to show you how to apply this to your life and uh, what's really going on right now. During the tribulation period, there's a seven year period when the Antichrist is going to have rule of the earth, and he's going to try to annihilate Israel because Christ is coming back to be king of Israel. And if the devil can destroy all the Jews, then Christ has no kingdom to come back to. The woman here is Israel. This is Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. It says, And the woman, that's Israel, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred three score days. That's three and a half years. The last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation period, the Antichrist is trying to destroy all the Jews. That's, a, that's what he focused all his attention on. That way, Christ has no kingdom to come back to. And Israel is protected in the wilderness for three and a half years. And then look what happens. And there was war in heaven. When? Three and a half years before Christ comes back, there's war in heaven. Who fights this war? Michael and his angels fought against who? The dragon. The dragon's the devil. Michael and his angels falling. You know, you know these Chinese and Japanese and Vietnam, when they holler, you're the dragon. And whenever the dragon catches these fire, a lot of these, uh, I can't remember, the Japanese or the Chinese restaurants, they got a dragon, they got a ball of fire in front of it. And the reason for that is they say when the dragon catches its fire, and that's when the enlightened ones here do to set us free and bring peace back to the world. So when they're hauling here, the dragon, the worship the dragon, the dragon's the devil. There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Look here. The dragon, the devil, prevailed not. Neither was their place, look here, found any more in heaven. He ain't allowed to accuse no more. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan was deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation strength and the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accuseth them before our God day and night. Day and night. Satan's desire is to accuse you. Satan's desire is to bring harm to you. Satan has no joy in your life at all unless he brings suffering or pain. Or hopefully you're never saved and get you to die that way you can go to hell. That's his desire. It's the shift you was weak. Look here. Not only is Satan cast out, since the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, Satan, which deceived the whole world. Look here. Satan is no longer allowed to accuse. He was cast out, and look here. His angels were cast out with him. All these evil angels, all these evil spirits, and the devil himself is going to be cast out. They never be able to accuse again. And that is great news. Because once this day comes, if you're God, you never have another worry. Praise the Lord, we don't have another worry of Christ in our heart as it is. But this is just great news that the accuser of the brother is cast out. Now I'm going to show you something, and this is going to try to bring all this together to be able to apply it to your life. I hope that you listen really good up to this point. Everybody loves kids, right? Do we not all love them? You 
know what? God loves them too. Look at this scripture. Jesus, these children are running after the Lord. And the apostles are rebuking them, trying to fight them down. And Jesus rebukes the apostles. And look what he says. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels, notice the plural there. One of these little ones, their angels. Look at a little one right there. Got two little ones right there. Got a bunch of little ones back there. Each one of them has more than one angel around them. At least two. You think there's a pretty good group of people here? Brother Ray, good guy. Brother Don, good guy. Dan's a good guy. Clyde and Bobby. I'm going to tell you something. Every kid you see, you see at least two angels. He's a great host of the power of beings here. Praise the Lord. And the Bible says, if we're in spirit, then the spirit of Jesus Christ himself is in this church. Our hearts ought to be in awe and humble before him. But every time you see a child, you see at least two angels. Take heed that you despise not a little kid. For I say to you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. I want to tell you something. When you were born, God placed angels about you. At least two. I don't know how many, but at least two. And until you got grown, He kept angels about you your whole life. But once you get grown, and once you start making certain decisions, that depends on if they stay around you or if you get more or if they're completely gone and the devil can just have his way to attack you. It, it, it starts coming into your house a little bit. It comes into your hands a little bit. I know salvation is not in your hands. I know you going to heaven is not in your hands. It's in the nail scarred hands. But I'm here to tell you, if you serve God, and not only did He have angels about you all your childhood, but He just keeps putting more and more and more angels about you. The closer you serve God, the more you serve God, the more time you take to spend with God, the more angels He keeps sending you so the devil has no part in your life. And the only way He allow any part of Satan to come in your life is like the story of Job. Just for a certain reason, just for a certain time here, you go through, through a certain trial just to give you back double what you once had. And it made Job even a better Christian or a better worshiper of God and he ended up with double. That was a trial. Sometimes we go through trials and tribulation. But outside of trials and tribulation, the devil can't even get close to you. You're encamped about with angels. Let me show you one of the favorite passages of Scripture. This is 2 Kings. They was a king of Syria at this time, and uh, he went to attack Israel and, uh, and with an ambush, a secret attack, and whenever they got there to secret attack, Israel was waiting on them. And then uh, another time he tried to do it again, Israel was waiting on them. Another time he tried to ambush, secret attack again, they was waiting on them. And finally, the king said, there's a spy, there's a spy, let's find the spy. Every time we go to secret attack, they're waiting on us. And one of them stood up and said, there's no there's a prophet in Israel for what you say in your bedchamber. He said, who's this prophet? They said, Elisha. So they sent a whole army against this one man of God. And in the morning when the servant woke up, Gehazi, he saw that the house completely surrounded with an army, with, a, with, an Assyrian, with the Syrian army. And uh, look what he says. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host can pass, not just the house, but the whole city. The host can pass the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said, Alas, my master, how shall we do? This man had given his whole life to God. He was, uh, if you know much about Elisha, he was plowing, and he had two oxen, and that was his life. And Elijah come by and said, follow me. And he immediately killed his two boxes, made a feast, and he, he, sold, he sold it out. Sold the business. He, he didn't have nothing to go back to. He sold everything and gave his life completely to God. And now he's so close to God that he's become this strong prophet. God's revealing all his secrets to him. And now the king of Syria, very powerful nation, 
has sent a whole army to not only surround his house, but the whole city that he's in. And his servant wakes up and sees this army surrounding him and says, what are we going to do? And look what he says. He's not afraid. He knows who his God is. He's not afraid. And Elisha answers, it's fear not. For they that are with us are more than they that be with them. And I'm sure the servant's thinking, man, the master's crazy. <laughs> it's me and you against all these guys. <laughs> what do you mean there's more with us? And then look what it says. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray for you. Open his eyes that he might see. You want us to marry with a lot of Christians? Our eyes ain't open. We're looking for these earthly eyes instead of the spiritual eyes. Hey, we've been caught out of darkness in these marvelous light. Let us not act like we're lost anymore. We are spiritual creatures. We have angels encamped about us. Praise the Lord. And Elijah said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened the eyes of a young man and he saw, and look here, there's an army surrounding him, but behind that army, the whole mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Down to Elijah. And when they came down to him, Elijah prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elijah. As a child, Elijah had some angels over him. But when he saw that, when he sold the business, when he sold the farm and gave all to God, God just kept up more and more angels about. And when the whole Syrian king and his army and the general and everybody down there just to try to get one man, can't get to him for all the angels. This is the God that loves you. He sent his son to die for you to save you. <clears throat> By all rights, you've seen them come short of God's glory. By all right, we're vessels fit for destruction. But Christ loves you. He came and He took your judgment upon Himself to give you everlasting life. If you're in here today and you ain't where you need to be, I promise you, you get where you need to be. People in camp you with angels. Even a lot of times as Christians. We get in backslidden conditions. We, we quit being obedient to the Lord. We start being obedient to self or to our own love, or our own desires. And we just think about all this strength with all these angels about us and the devil's got more influence in our life than normal. I'm here to tell you, Satan can go before God and accuse you. If you want to have a good life, if you want to be close to God, if you want to have what Elijah had, sell the farm. Sell it Give everything up. What's worth holding on to anyway? The house that you worked 30 years to pay for is going to rot just like your body's going to rot. And it's like it never existed nor you. So what? Who cares if you got a mansion on a hill? Who cares if you got 10 swimming pools? When you're rotten and you become dust, who cares? But if you've got angels about you and the Spirit of God in you, you've got everlasting joy. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. You've got everlasting joy. And even in this life, let me tell you how powerful an angel is. There's 185,000 men army coming against Hezekiah. Hezekiah turned. And he put his face to the wall and he prayed to God. And because he trusted solely 100% in God and in God alone, God sent one angel. And he smote him in one night. That's how powerful an angel is. Could you imagine having all these angels like Elijah had? Sell the farm. Isn't that of greater value to be encamped about the holy angels of God and have the Spirit of Christ leading and guiding you than worldly pleasure? I challenge you today. God's no respecter of person. He'll make you a powerful, powerful being if you'll submit unto Him. He'll put angels about you. He'll put His Spirit within you. Do you know that even Satan himself will run from you if you get to where you need to be? The Bible says, resist the devil. It says, submit thyself unto God. Resist the devil. The devil's one of the highest, strongest angels. Fight with Michael the archangel. Submit yourself. 
yourself unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee. What's flee mean? Everybody know what flee means? Run. Resist the devil and he will run from you. When you're encamped about with a whole host of angels and you got the Almighty God in your heart, the devil will run from you when you know who you are and you're on fire with God. And the only time, the only time he ever be able to do anything in your life is in a situation like Job. When God allows you to go through a trial or a tribulation, only when you come out of it to bless you greater on the other side. I hope this message has touched your heart. I hope it's give you some wisdom and knowledge of how to have a better life. Put God first. Put love first. Put the church first. The worldly things are going to perish. And you're going to perish as far as this world. But if you don't make this world your home, if you think this world is not my home, I've got a home in heaven. If you think God is my God, New Jerusalem is my home, I'm a citizen up there, there's angels about me, there's the Spirit of God within me, I am a spiritual creature, this body is not my body, this body is dust, and it's going back to dust, just like my great-grandfather and my father and his father before him went back to dust, even so is my body going back to dust, but I'm not this body, I'm a spiritual being on the inside. It seems like we don't understand that we're not this body, this body is dust and it's going back to dust, you're the being that controls it. Be filled with the Spirit. Be encamped about with angels. Give your heart to God. Sell the farm if it takes it. Give yourself to God. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know He had angels about you to a certain point and they still have. But there's coming a time when the devil will go before the throne to accuse you. And God will say, okay, they've rejected me. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. And he said, okay. Just like he let the evil spirit come up on Saul. Just like he let the lying spirit go to the mouth of the prophets to have Ahab kill. There'd be a time that he'd just say, all right, you don't want me. Don't let that happen to you. It's Brother Daniel and Sharon. One, a lot of times the lost don't even realize is how spiritual everything is. Everything on this earth is temporary. It's going to die. It's going to be destroyed. But everything spiritual is eternal. It's forever. God is a spirit. The angels are spirits. And inside of you is a spirit. And it's all forever. And the devil desires to get your spirit. And if you reject God long enough, God will allow him to come to heaven. Don't let that happen. As the church stands, if you ain't here today and you don't know Christ as Savior, come before it's everlasting. Some people die in their 20s, some in their 80s.